what length of time uh, does the site want to be able to power through a grid outage? In this case, we modeled uh, three scenarios of a, a three-day outage, a one-week, and up to a two-week outage. Next step, once we know what we're dealing with, what's the, the layout on the ground, and what is the target that we're trying to hit, is to gather the relevant data. Um, most important for uh, the modeling we do is what does the energy use look like? What amounts are used at what times of day uh, over the course of the year? Um, that's called a load profile. And to create a load profile for our study, we started with the utility bills from the four buildings involved. Uh, there were gaps, as you can see on the screen. Uh, we did not have data from every month of the year for all of the buildings. So we used a tool called Energy Plus that enables us to basically fill in the gaps, patch the, the missing pieces, to create a representative load profile, what we call a synthetic load profile. And you can see at the bottom of the screen uh, what that looks like over the 24 hours of the average weekday of every month of the year. And keep that shape in mind as you see it again on this next slide. That's the black line. Uh, once we have the goals of the study, the constraints and parameters of the site, and the load profile, uh, we begin the modeling process. We put all that data into our software tool and start uh, simulating outages and uh, messing with uh, the future prices of energy uh, to determine what's going to be uh, the best fit to meet that load profile uh, through the length of outage that's desired and how that compares to the reference case of not having an on-site energy system buying all the energy from the grid uh, or using fuel in conventional systems and uh, having those outages. One thing that's quite important um, about the outage, you have to give it a price. If you tell the model that there is no cost to an outage, it will tell you don't do anything. Uh, if, there, if you imagine a, an outage to have no economic impact, then uh, your cheapest option is to not worry about it. So you have to assume there to be a cost of an outage. In this study, we used an accepted industry standard of around $12.70 per kilowatt hour of unmet load. Important point, though, that is a number that comes from studies on commercial and industrial operations. And that uh, it's, it's a reasonable number, an established number. But in this case, we're looking at an emergency center. So if you're taking the value of an emergency center to be uh, the human life that it can support in the, in the event of an emergency, uh, you may consider that value to be much higher. So we believe this number is a reasonable benchmark, um, but it is a conservative one. And if uh, a site, as, as some do, some of the systems that we model are deemed completely mission critical, where uh, examples, um, data centers, military bases, air traffic control towers at airports, it's 100% um, uptime all the time. So in those cases, the cost of an outage is simply unacceptable. And if you model uh, with a, and basically an infinite cost of, of an outage, it will recommend a different system, one that is more resilient against uh, ever losing power. Now, that's not what we did in this case. We used an industry benchmark. Um, and as you'll see, it recommended, um, you'll see in the results, the systems that it recommended building at the, the two-week outage, um, it became cheaper uh, in the model's view to accept this cost of, of um, curtailed load, meaning in, in the modeling, the system did not supply uh, power in, during a two-week outage for part of, of that two weeks. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more when we look at the results. So we've entered the goals of the project to ride through a, a three-day, a one-week, or a two-week outage. That's, those are the scenarios we modeled. We put in the load profile, and we ran the, the model. To meet that black line, the load profile, with a variety of different 
uh, on-site energy systems, as well as the grid power. Um, the model tells us uh, how much, uh, what size of each energy asset we should be installing, and also the operational logic for how we should be using it over time. Uh, for example, the, the pink line on this slide shows the state of charge of the battery system uh, when it is discharging and recharging over the course of a 24-hour day. We'll look now for a bit at the results. Um, what the model tells us after we input the data and we hit the optimize button, it puts out a set of numbers. It tells us the capital expense of the systems that we might install, the operating expense of those systems over their useful lifetime, and that tells us what is the levelized cost of energy, the cost of a delivered kilowatt hour uh, of electricity or a BTU of heat, um, given the upfront cost, the cost of capital, um, and which uh, that's determined by the interest rates that would be available if you were to use a loan. Um, in this case, we modeled with 7%, uh, which is, a, a, again, a reasonable benchmark for what utilities use uh, when they're modeling um, the cost of something up front versus its value over time. In, in case anybody's unfamiliar with time value of money, whenever you're looking at buying something now that will return value in the future, you have to consider your cost of, uh, of capital, which is your, your interest rate if you were to borrow, or your opportunity cost of capital if you were to invest that money into something else. So in this case, we use 7%. Um, again, a standard for utility projects. And what we saw is that uh, the, the graph here is showing the payback period if we assume there to be, during the useful life of the project, an outage of two weeks. And the payback period for the project is under three years under those circumstances. When we do the modeling, we also have to consider the available renewable energy that could be achieved with energy systems on site. We had four areas that we were looking at, um, potential parking lot canopies, and a, one area of roof that we considered as options for installing solar PV. The total area that they provided was about 3,000 square meters, which uh, over the course of, of a year, obviously you get more energy out of a solar array in the summer, um, but the curves shown here are the output of an average day for each month of the year. And as you can see, even in a month like this, January, December, you're still getting um, power out of a photovoltaic system, a reduction of about 35 to 40 percent from the best months of the year, but they do produce power year round. Uh, the model um, looks at where we are on the map, the amount of space we told it would be available for installing solar panels, and it gives us the potential output from those panels. It also produces a schematic. We're looking at a one-line diagram of the system uh, that we would recommend. In this case, the way the campus is set up now, there are two points of coupling to the utility grid. Uh, one from this building and one from the police and fire station. Um, we recommend to enable islanding uh, at the lowest cost uh, possible that one of those would simply be removed, leaving one point of common coupling with the utility grid and having an uh, automatic isolation switch at that point, which would be controlled by a microgrid controller system. The microgrid controller senses if the surrounding grid loses power and automatically um, flips the, the isolation switch to island itself, uh, and then controls the energy assets within the microgrid system to meet the loads um, in, in an optimal way. That optimal way, again, is, is determined uh, by the model what it theoretically would be. Um, I say theoretically because we're using historical data, and in real time, uh, there's actually a bit of variation um, in the future it's, it's never identical to the past. So uh, this is sized around historical data, uh, which gets you within a reasonable margin of error of what you would expect in the future. Uh, an actual microgrid controller functioning in real time 
would have a slight bit of difference from the operational logic uh, recommended by the model. What we saw uh, in terms of the numbers, um, the, depending on whether we assumed there to be no outage, a three-day outage, seven-day, or a, a two-week outage, the model, of course, recommended uh, different sizes uh, of different technologies. The least uh, amount of solar, well, if we, if we assume there's no outage at all, um, the model does not recommend installing anything. It says use the utility. Uh, in that case, we're spending about uh, just under $65,000 a year on energy. Um, we're pretty close to that. If we model a three-day outage, the, um, the recommended system includes about $406,000 worth of installed solar PV. Now that has obviously a capital expense, the upfront cost of installing the PV. However, it then produces energy over its useful life. So in that case, the annual expense is just slightly higher than no system. So you achieve added resilience that allows you to ride through a three-day outage at just over $65,000 a year annualized cost. So a slight margin more than the cost of energy now uh, and achieving some sustainability, some, some renewable energy in the mix and also achieving some resilience. That amount of solar will not get the, um, the complex through a seven-day outage. For a seven-day outage, the recommended amount of solar um, had a nameplate capacity of 324 kilowatts at a cost of uh, $834,000. Uh, there, though, again, the, the annualized cost of energy did increase uh, to about $102,000 a year. Um, but it uh, did achieve the reliability target of riding through a seven-day outage. Um, one of the important things uh, I wanted to mention about the photovoltaic versus using, there is already uh, an on-site generator. The generator is a 200 kilowatt Kohler. Uh, the peak demand of all four buildings is only 132 kilowatts. So the existing generator is more than large enough to power all the buildings. However, uh, when modeled with only the generator, it does run out of fuel in the existing 411 gallon tank within the one week, uh, the seven day outage. And in a situation where there is a widespread outage, if there's a, a big emergency going on, um, whether it be a, a hurricane that's moved further up the co coast than normal, or an extreme heat wave, an extreme uh, ice storm, if power is, is knocked out to a very wide area, um, one of the risks in a rural setting like West Newberry is that resources may be concentrated uh, to the urban centers. And there may also be supply chain risk. Other things could be happening in the world. The useful life of this system is 20 years. So if you imagine how different things are uh, now from 20 years ago, you can imagine that over the useful life of this project, there is some supply chain risk around um, the, your fuel sources to power your generator. So although it, it's actually cheaper to do a system that uses only the existing generator, as opposed to taking advantage of the solar real estate in the parking lots and installing solar PV, installing the solar PV uh, does help hedge against supply chain risk. Uh, and we also modeled uh, without any cost of carbon emissions for small generation, which is the current regulatory structure. Uh, there has been um, a number of uh, calls to action through, the, through New York's REV proceeding to put a, a cost of carbon emissions on smaller uh, generation sources. Currently, uh, New Hampshire is in the REGI market, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative market, which is a carbon cap and trade program but it only impacts generators over 20 megawatts, so certainly not the, the 200 kilowatt Kohler that's here. However, people have been working in state capitals and, and from the grassroots to put a cost of carbon emissions on smaller generation, which would impact the economics of this municipal campus microgrid and which uh, the solar can help hedge against. The levelized cost of energy uh, without anything being done 
is almost 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, I should mention something about energy. We're, we're talking about energy thermal and electrical, and I'm, I'm putting it in terms of kilowatt hours. That's because BTUs and kilowatt hours, both being me measures of energy, can be converted one to the other <laughs> with a standard conversion factor of about 29 uh, kilowatt hours per BTU. So in the modeling, uh, we converted the thermal loads of the buildings, which are served by natural gas boilers, into kilowatt hours. So everything is expressed in terms of kilowatt hours. And this is the blended cost of energy for the thermal and the electrical. Uh, with no system change whatsoever, the blended cost of energy for the facilities is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, with adding um, enough solar to ride through a three-day outage, it still is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So you're, uh, that amount of solar uh, to support a, a three-day ride through almost the same uh, cost as what is being spent now. On the more expensive end, if we look at uh, the, the worst case scenario, a two week outage in December, we see the cost is almost double. And why is that? Part of it is because if we assume a two week outage in December, uh, the, the model uses all the available space for solar. You can see the, that row, um, the PV purchase is the same uh, for those four scenarios there, seven and, and 14 day outage in July and December, that's because it's used all the available space. So it's hit the limit, it, it ran into that constraint. It installs more solar, it installs a bigger battery, but it also ends up running out of power. So in the 14 day outage scenario uh, in December, the generator's diesel tank runs out of fuel, the battery eventually runs out of uh, stored energy. The solar on the constrained space that we were able to model uh, is not able to power 100% of all loads for a full uh, 14 days. And so in that scenario, we end up with some curtailed load. Now we assumed in this study that all loads were equal and that we were going to meet 100% of them. That's not exactly a, a realistic assumption. So important to note, uh, in a, a real life scenario, there would be load shedding, and not all loads hold equal value. The communication system for the police and fire department is more valuable than the lights in an average room. So what a real microgrid controller would do is shed the non-essential loads and keep power to the critical loads. Uh, in this modeling, the reason we see that high of a cost uh, under the 14-day outage scenario is that we assumed the curtailed loads were also critical. So um, it would be uh, entirely feasible to build a system that would supply power through 14 days, just not 100% of the current building loads. Some would be shed. So at the maximum, uh, the system that was recommended by the model comes just under $890,000, and at the minimum, uh, around $400,000. The $400,000 system basically pays for itself through the energy that it creates, and over its 20-year uh, useful life, the annualized cost is just a tiny hair more than is being spent on energy today. Uh, to justify the more expensive system, you'd have to assume that there is a significant value to the resilience and that you also wanted, um, for instance, the greenness of the energy and or you wanted that uh, hedge against supply chain risk or fuel price volatility uh, for the diesel. So our recommendations based on the study. Uh, another aspect that is very relevant for uh, the economics of these projects is the incentive programs that are available. 2019, the year we're in now, has, is the last year that the federal investment tax credit will be available at the full 30% uh, that it started at a while ago. Um, they're, they're about to start ramping down the investment tax credit. Now, as a town, um, if there's, or as a nonprofit, uh, there may not be income tax to offset. So to take advantage of the investment tax credit, 
it uh, is common practice and sometimes necessary to bring in a tax equity partner, which is uh, an investment fund that pays for the project, takes advantage of the tax credit, has income to uh, income taxes to offset, uh, and then eventually transfers the project uh, to the town or uh, the other end user that wasn't able on its own to take advantage of those tax shields. But 2019 is the last year that's available. At close to a third of the total installed cost of a project, that can be an attractive incentive. And this is a good year in which, uh, to, well, the last year, in which the full 30% is available. While this is ramping down, uh, the other incentive that's relevant here in Massachusetts is the Mass Smart program. The Smart program is for solar energy, and it is uh, intended to procure 1.6 gigawatts of nameplate capacity of solar uh, generation to be installed in Massachusetts. That's not, uh, it's not happening all at once, and it's not all uh, at the same rate. It's happening in blocks, and the blocks uh, will go down in value over time. Um, currently, right now, uh, for this system, uh, under the tariff that it would, it would fall under in the Mass Smart program, it would be eligible for an incentive payment of about 12 and a half cents per kilowatt hour, which is quite substantial uh, relative to your cost of energy delivered from the utility. It, it's almost equal. So the Mass uh, Smart program, um, that level of incentive will be available this year. It is going to go down. Uh, so for projects where construction began in 2019, they're eligible for the full investment tax credit and also uh, for the higher level of the Mass Smart program. So our recommendation is to pursue the project in phases. Two of the things that are most obvious and lowest hanging fruit are simply to enable the islanding. Uh, to do that, the different buildings here would need to be uh, interconnected electrically slightly differently than they are now. The exact best way to do that, um, we would have to have a conversation with the utility um, because our recommendation to use a single point of common coupling would involve um, either buying or leasing some of the utility's wires uh, from them. The wire from the, the current transformer to this building, uh, which runs through a conduit under the parking lot, would be repurposed uh, to create this system, and it would have to either be purchased from or leased from uh, the utility to do that. Um, going to a single point of common coupling would also free up one of the uh, transformers, which the utility would have to want to, uh, to have freed up, and it could then remove it and use it somewhere else. Uh, so that the exact architecture of that system, uh, there should be a conversation with National Grid to determine what they'd be uh, willing and, and able to do. But enabling islanding is a fairly obvious first step. Um, whether it's with one or two points of common coupling, we're recommending one because that would be cheaper uh, in terms of having an automatic isolation switch in a single place instead of two. Um, it can be done with two. It's just you have to pay for one more switch. And the switches can run between five and $50,000 a piece depending on how fast uh, you want them to be able to island. If you want them island within seconds, that's one switch. If it's in nanoseconds, that's another switch. So your uh, needs here would probably be on the cheaper end of the scale, but still better not to buy more than one $5,000 switch if you don't have to. So we recommend uh, proceeding in phases. We recommend installing islanding capability with either one or two points of common coupling with the grid and a controller system that would tell that switch when to flip into island mode. We recommend using the existing generator, which is currently set up to serve only one or perhaps two of the buildings, um, but it could easily, in terms of its capacity, serve all four. Uh, so we recommend um, using it in that way. And we recommend also um, getting started with the PV panels. They don't have to be fully commercially operational in 2019 to take advantage of the investment tax credit. Uh, the SMART program, you have to uh, see where they were at with their blocks that they'll be, um, they, there's an application process that you have to get into uh, the available block. Um, 
but for the project at least to be substantially started, meaning construction has broken ground in 2019, it's eligible for the uh, full investment tax credit, and uh, that gives it the best chance of getting the higher value uh, incentive in the Mass Smart program. The battery energy storage system, or BESS as they're called, we would recommend not um, necessarily buying that this year. The reason being that over the last uh, seven years, lithium ion battery costs have come down 80%, and in the same period of time, their energy density has increased by 40%. In other words, a lot of improvements, um, both in the cost and in the capabilities of the technology. Uh, so we would recommend giving that um, maybe a wait, unless there are funds available and there's a strong desire to have the system um, in its final form as soon as possible. We also looked at combined heat and power and fuel cells. We are not recommending them at this time. The reason we're not recommending combined heat and power is that the gas boilers in these buildings are relatively new and very efficient, over 92% efficient, whereas combined heat and power systems are usually, um, they top out around 78% efficiency. So given the, the newness and the quality of the existing heating systems, we would recommend use them through their existing useful life. Uh, Consider again uh, taking a look at combined heat and power when it comes time to potentially uh, replace those boilers in the future. Fuel cells uh, similarly are um, more than twice as expensive as solar PV in terms of the energy they can deliver and are uh, very immature technology at the scale of these buildings. There are quite um, proven fuel cells that have been years in operation at the one to 20 megawatt scale, which is an order of magnitude or two larger than you would need here. So at the 200 kilowatt and smaller scale, the fuel cells are very expensive and very new. So it was one of the things the Energy Committee asked us to look at. Um, we're not recommending that technology at this time. We would be very happy to take this project with you uh, through the detailed engineering and implementation phase. Also happy to look at any projects in the surrounding area. Um, again, I'm the director of the team, Andrea. Here is the program manager. Um, we've actually had our remit grow a little bit when we started this project about half a year ago. I was the practice lead for Americas and now uh, the global director for smart and distributed energy with Worley Parsons. Um, but what that means is that our teams have grown and we have uh, lots of um, travel in our schedules. We'd be happy to keep uh, West Newberry on the, the tr path of travel, uh, come back here and see this uh, system start to take place. So I've been talking quite a lot. I'm not sure if there are questions from uh, the board or the, the audience here, but if there are, I'd be happy to answer any that I can. Great, thank you very much. That was pretty comprehensive. Um, I'll start here. If you have any questions, Arthur, do you have any questions? Yeah, the, the question, the, um, your analysis on the, um, the, co the cost per kilowatt and so forth, a and adding uh, uh, solar, uh, solar cells versus uh, mm. just using the generator versus doing nothing and so forth. Did, did that include the the um, thirty percent uh, credits and so forth, or or not? Did, did yes, yes. So the the thirty percent investment tax credit is applied to the total installed cost of the system. That can include a battery energy storage system if it if the battery is charged only from the renewable generation. So we when we looked at total installed cost. We modeled it with using the investment tax credit against that total installed cost. Okay. So the question is, so then you had, so then you said for the two-day, two-week outage, it was eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So the cost of that, eight hundred, a little bit on, yeah, eight hundred and eighty-seven thousand. Now, would the cost be thirty percent less than that, or that figure right there is already with the thirty percent discount? That is with the thirty percent discount. Yes. You okay, mentioned the Excuse me. Yeah. Could you just because people can't oh. hear you at home, they can see you and, and they're going to. What did she say? So, 
This is for at home. It's not actually for here. So thank you. Hold on. You, you can take it with you if you like, because I think Rick has a question next that he can. Well, I can anticipate the question because we're talking about uh, about total install costs and ways of reducing that total install cost. Mm -hmm. The battery, the, all of the equipment costs that we used are based on our own vendor databases and recent project history. Um, in addition to those prices that um, we obtained from equipment vendors, their kind of catalog price, I'm pretty sure what Andrea wanted to point out is that in uh, projects we've worked on, we take uh, a technology agnostic position as Worley Parsons has no invested interest in any hardware. And in that role, we take uh, more an owner's engineer position, sit on the side of the table with the client and have uh, vendors compete for the project. So we issue competitive RFQs, requests for quotations to vendors. And through that, we've been able to reduce the asking price of large battery energy storage systems um, we did one recently, a half megawatt system, and we were able to bring the cost down um, by a little more than 30 percent uh, from where the vendors started. So that's one of the, the advantages of um, being in a, not, not just uh, the, the large firm that we're in, which uh, it does have good bargaining power, but also being in the position that you're in now as, uh, as innovative, um, you know, lead projects that are starting to think about these things. Uh, the, there was a conversation earlier about when did West Newberry and when did um, Boxborough become uh, green, uh, green energy towns, right? Uh, because it's still a thing that is starting to happen, the technology vendors are quite eager to build their name, their reputation, get their equipment out, and when there are projects like this that are, are innovative and interesting, uh, the tech vendors will often compete um, pretty strongly with each other. So another reason that 2019, 2020 are good years uh, for doing these kinds of projects is that it's a, it's a market making moment. We see this a lot as we work with the tech vendors. Uh, they're willing to reduce prices substantially um, when we get them to compete among each other to have their name on a project. Okay. Rick, I think you had a question, unless Joe, did you have one? You did I did. So Tristan, thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, and um, uh, I guess I apologize, I should have introduced you at the outset here and sort of explained the basis for all this, because we were sitting with a selectman who had already received a certain amount of information, I forgot that there's Presumably, somebody on the other side of the camera and the microphone here who's seeing this. So, you know, this is all funded by a grant that we got from the state <clears throat> to, uh, you know, contemplate or investigate the feasibility of a microgrid that would support the municipal campus of the public safety complex, the annex, the 1910 building, and the senior housing that's uh, contiguous with it all. <clears throat> and um, and uh, purpose would be to provide uh, business continuity. Uh, to provide a uh, place of refuge for people in the event of, ex of an extreme weather event that caused a large portion of the community to lose power for a prolonged period of time, and also um, to provide an ongoing revenue stream to any renewable generation. But that wasn't really why I came up here. I just wanted to get that out. Um, <laughs> so um, question, Tristan, that probably should have thought to ask you back when we first reviewed this was, um, say for the 14-day the outage and the um, uh, capital cost of uh, 855.93 for um, whichever, whichever period you use. Mm -hmm. um, did that account for the likelihood, near certainty, that some outside entity uh, that had money that it needed to invest in order to recognize or realize the um, thirty percent um, investment tax credit. Um, did did that assume that that was somebody else's money? That portion of it was somebody else's money, or did that assume that the town was coming up with that money? That's a great question. Um, and I should also clarify that this, the modeling that we have done, uh, this is not the system itself. This is not mm -hmm. detailed engineering and designed to where we have a buildable blueprint. This is more 
an opening and laying the groundwork for the conversation to drill into some of these details. Where is the capital coming from? Is it, is it the towns? Is it a third party investor? What is the cost of that capital? What ultimately are, uh, are the stakeholders most concerned about? Is there uh, a value perceived uh, among those who are making decisions about the system in the renewable uh, aspect of the energy or in the uh, supply chain, the, the hedge against supply chain or, or uh, fuel price volatility. Um, the question on the capital. We assumed that there was a 7% cost of capital. Now, the, in economics, a dollar today is always better than one tomorrow. So we, we have to assume a cost of capital. Um, money now that's paid back in benefits over time, you have to, to balance the, the effect of that time. Now, if the capital were to come from a third party, there are capital providers that have, uh, that have lending rates lower than 7%. There are those also that, that have rates higher than that. If we're talking about the town's own money, you could say we have it available, we're gonna call the cost of capital zero, if that's what people want us to assume in the model, that would change these numbers. Um, so we modeled assuming that there would be a 7% cost of capital. Now, again, there are capital providers who would give you a loan at exactly that rate. Uh, there are others that might be willing to loan for less. There are certainly others who would be willing to loan for more, uh, including banks have rates as low as 3.5%, uh, 4%. So depending on your source of capital, your overall project economics are going to change. And we didn't have a, kind of a pre-approval letter from a lender. Uh, we did know that under a, a certain value, the town itself might be able to provide the capital. Um, but until we have nailed down uh, what exactly is the project that the town does want, so what is its total installed cost um, with uh, the margin of error narrowed, you know, knowing uh, what in fact will be installed and, and over what time frame. And then we put together the cap the financing package for that, whether it's coming out of the, a municipal bond, whether it's coming out of uh, the town's cash reserves, or whether it's coming from a third party capital provider, uh, we can't consider these numbers final. So does that answer your question well enough? Well, um, maybe I didn't phrase it right. Um, you need to use the microphone. Oh, you can bring the microphone to you if you'd like. Maybe I didn't phrase that right. Uh, you know, so the town would look at this and say, oh, so I have to spend, have to invest, however you want to look at it, um, you know, $850,000 for a round number. Um, yeah, obviously there's a, so I, I refer to that as cost of capital. Um, does the cost of capital actually represent the capital or the, or the cost of using somebody else's capital? And, and, and what I really was wondering is how out of that number um, would any of that capital be um, owned by any of the capital invested? be owned by another entity other than the town that was then, and I don't want to make this overly complicated, that was then providing yeah, energy have. as a service. You yeah, you Sorry. are. Sorry. <laughs> okay, don't worry. So just get it complicated. Okay. Let, yeah. let, me, let me try it one more time to okay. see, see if I can answer the question. If, if we assume now... First, no, hold on. First of all, I think it'd be important, and I'm not trying to be funny or anything, um, let's try to understand, before you answer a question, I don't even know what the question is. So it might be better to define that question if you can for layman's like myself and maybe people watching at home and then you can answer it because well, you might answer something and we still don't know what you're talking about because we don't even know what the question was. <laughs> you know, I, let, me, let me see if I, can, if I can reframe your question. Okay, great. Um, I think what you're asking is, does, is this number dependent on where the, num the money's coming from? That'll, that'll partly suffice. Do, do, are the costs that we're showing here, does, is that tied to whose money is it? Uh, 
and the capital cost is not, okay? The capital cost is the cash that has to be put down in the construction year to get the project built. So that's tied to what is built, okay? The annualized cost is tied to where the money comes from. And uh, the, this other term, the levelized cost of energy, is tied to where the money comes from. Because if you have the money yourself, and therefore you have no borrowing costs, it's like if you bought a house cash or took out a mortgage from the bank, if you buy it cash, you don't pay interest on it. Uh, so if you have the money yourself, then your annualized cost you could perceive to be lower. That's just your initial upfront cost divided by the 20 useful years of the project life, which you can see right away would be closer to $40,000, right? So that annualized cost is, take, it's that capital cost spread over time with 7% interest attached to it. So imagine getting a mortgage at 7% interest, that would be a pretty expensive mortgage, and over the 20 or 30 year term of that loan, you would pay more in interest than you borrowed. You understand? So the capital cost is determined by what is being installed. What are the costs of those pieces of equipment and the cost of construction? Also, there's a little cost in here for interconnection to the utility. But that pays for the microgrid controller, the isolation switch, the solar panels, the racking equipment, the battery, um, any cabling that has to be done. And that's, that's fixed based on what is the system being built, you know, how much you have to pay for the things that go into it, and how much you have to pay workers to build it. The annualized cost, though, that is connected to your cost of capital. So if you borrow it at 7%, you'd see this annualized cost. Uh, um, that's the cost of the full project, plus its operating expense over its 20-year useful life. So the annualized cost is of useful life of 20 years, so you take 65, 65K, you times it by 20, 20 right? That, so that's your annualized cost, and it comes out to $1.3 million, and that would be on the low end. So that would be the 406. Um, well, you, you are seeing here, the, to your point, um, your, the energy that is purchased now over the useful life of this project uh, costs more than the project. Right, so there, these projects do have a positive net present value. They more than pay back the cost of installing the equipment that produces the energy. Except for if we install one for the two-week one, I thought. So again, if you look, you if that. you if you look right here at this is load curtailed, mm -hmm. right? So for the the this seven-day outage in December and the the 14-day outage, there's a lot of power that's not being provided. Correct. And we assume that number of kilowatt hours not provided times uh, the cost of lost load, uh, $12.70. Now, as we talked about a little bit ago, though, not all loads are equal in reality. Mm -hmm. And the Energy Committee asked us, can you model this keeping 100% of the loads yeah, on the whole time? And that is not what you would really do. That's not how you would we'd operate. Shut, we'd shut. You would shut off some of these lights. You would keep the communications towers on, you know, till, mm -hmm. for, till the very end. Um, but part of that higher annualized cost in the, the two-week outage scenario is coming from the assumed cost of not being able to provide 100% of the loads over the, the course of that outage. Because of December. And December. Now, we can go right back to the model. It's, it's in our system. We can shed 20% of the load over that two-week period and ride all the way through, and we can show you what the annualized cost looks like then uh, without assuming a cost of not being able to provide uh, the full load for those two weeks. Okay. Joe, did you have a question? Yeah. So uh, the... Uh, Capital cost 406 range to 887. Uh, eight, Three day, 14 day. Mm -hmm. Okay, got that. You talked about phase one, enabling islanding, islanding et cetera, starting PV. Mm -hmm. So, what is that exactly within, like, how does that fit into that? that? Like, because starting PV, I mean, I don't. So, if all you did 
in 2019 was enable islanding and use the existing generator. You, it would depend a little bit on which controller you chose. In the report, we listed uh, the providers that we would recommend for a microgrid controller. And we talked just a bit ago um, briefly about the costs of um, automatic uh, isolation switches. Right? So it would, if you only enabled islanding and did not install any new renewable generation, uh, any new generation at all, you just use the existing 200 kilowatt Kohler and you add isolation switches and a microgrid controller system. Uh, the least I could imagine that costing would probably be around fifty thousand dollars. Oh, so it's not okay. Um, the uh, you wouldn't want one of the super high end ones. There, there are systems. Super high, what, those controller things. You're talking about? Yes, uh, it, we we've installed them for military bases where they want um, perfect power. If the if the grid goes down, they don't. Even they don't even want to see it. Like a flicker of the lights. Just the controller system for that can be a million and a half dollars. You don't need one of those here. Um, we like flickers. <laughs> um, and, and on the, the lower end, uh, I would recommend a system that would probably be in the range of fifty to two hundred thousand dollars for that microgrid controller and the isolation switches. And that would depend partly on does it have one or two points of common coupling with the national grid system. But you would probably start installing panels to some degree. Yes. Also. Yes. Um, the panels would uh, would add the rest of the so cost. So that it would depend how many panels were your okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And and also where did you put them? We looked at four different sites. They could go on. We looked at parking lot canopies and we looked at the uh, roof, um, the roof of the annex. A parking lot canopy because it's got more metal in the the supports. Uh, those cost about 15% more per nameplate capacity as compared to a rooftop system. Uh, so you spend a little bit more on those, but that's also where most of the space was. Okay. So what we really would want to look at is that chart, that graphic you have up there with, I don't know what your term was, but shedding load or whatever. Yes, you, you would want some like load shedding. or whatever. Yes, that's right. real numbers. Yeah. Or you real can numbers. also tell the model um, load shed to the point where I don't incur um, you know any of that cost you can and it, it wouldn't shed it all at the end you know you could um, imagine that in the event of an outage you immediately shed uh, what are deemed to be non-essential loads in your breaker room you have a number of switches that are connected to different circuits mm -hmm. your microgrid controller wires into that breaker box and it can shut off anything that you, you, you have to tell it a sort of a force ranked priority. In uh, theory, we could go down to 60%. Right. I mean, we, right. The, we would make that determination of we, how we felt if we were going to have an outage, what we felt, felt was essential, and, That's right. and then implementing some costs into it. That's right. And, and you can program an automated sequence, and you also have a manual override. Rick? Yeah, so. Um, Say for a three-day outage, the town probably wants to, if it can, continue as normal, continue to operate as normal. For a one-week outage, businesses around you, all the stuff that the town interfaces with, is going to begin begin to taper off. Okay, if we have that kind of a weather event, other businesses are not going to be operating. So this building isn't going to have to operate as it normally would. At two weeks, most of the other businesses you generally integrate with or, or interface with right. outside aren't going to be working at all. And so, well, so, so it sort of goes into the, the load curtailment just becomes, you know, the, some of the loads that you want to curtail become obvious because you don't need to support those services anymore because nobody else is, is still operating. And at some point, it really is just a case of providing basic services like emergency services and, uh, and a place of refuge. Maybe, yeah, but we don't have businesses. We have all residents, so that that analogy might we but interface. You do interface with the outside world still. That. Yeah, but in that respect, I think would be just trying to interface with the. It might, it might local. be increased actually. Yeah, yeah, it might be increased because yeah, I, I don't. I understand where you're going with that, but yeah. I don't might not agree I don't with think it. it applies as much. 
No, because we're trying to, would have more people maybe coming here looking for services and looking for things and trying to help them because they don't have the power that they accustom at their home. Have more than usual. Yeah. yeah, we also, we did not model any additional loads. Um, maybe the town wants to have one or more electric vehicle charging stations, potentially even an electrically powered uh, emergency vehicle if there's any disruption at any point over the next 20 years in uh, the availability of fuel. Or if you would just want to start preparing for uh, the electrification of transportation, in which case, clearly, if you're adding uh, electric vehicle charging stations, then that's an additional load. Even under business as usual, if the power's out to the surrounding area for two weeks, people are going to want to charge their cell phones and their laptops. Mm. And uh, so it, you're absolutely right, Glenn. There may be an increase in activity and loads under those circumstances. What happens in the case that we build a wall around West Newbury? <laughs> and we, we want to electrify it. Will this be able to? I mean, there's a lot of talk about that. I'm not sure if we're going to do that. Hopefully, we don't. But you um, just never know who gets elected. Well, I think the thing to do is, uh, in that case, you'd want to get Canada to pay for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they might, you know, they they might say, "Look, you guys, you you want that wall that bad? We will pay for no, it. Just no, stay no. stay inside it." But um, I, you know, I I think we might have to do a polling of the population on the, the perceived value. Um, so I, um, you deal, when, when we're dealing with these solar voltaic uh -huh. things, um, you deal with kilowatt hour yes. on the size of it. Yeah. Can you tell me how, it's just a person, like how big is that? Yes. Well, you know what I mean? I mean, yes. I don't know how some of them are bigger than they are now, or the, the industry has gotten a lot sure. better, so they'd be uh, smaller and more sure. efficient. So how big would that, when you say, can it be in our, hypothetically, just say in the back parking lot, how, yes. how big would that be? Okay, so first of all, um, when we're talking about solar, mm -hmm. we're saying, we have been saying photovoltaic. Mm -hmm. That means when sunlight hits it, it produces electricity. Mm -hmm. We keep saying PV for s photovoltaic um, because there are other solar panels that produce thermal energy. So solar thermal is, is another thing, just to make sure we're clear on that distinction. Solar can produce electricity or heat. Um, what we saw as having the most value here was the electricity. So we we're talking PV, photovoltaic. Um, now, uh, for those who can see this table here, that would be about 180 watts, which, which is, is 0 0.18 a kilowatts. Four foot table by two and a half feet or two yeah. feet. Two by and there are panels about that size. Most, most panels are a little bit bigger now. That they'd, they'd be maybe a, about a four foot by about a three foot panel, so like say 12 mm -hmm. square feet. Um, that's around 300 watts which is 0.3 kilowatts. A, a kilowatt is a, a thousand watts, the kilo for thousand. Um, a watt, what can you do with a watt? Uh, with one watt, you could kind of charge a phone. Um, these lights, one of these, is pro uh, one of these tubes is uh, probably about a 20 or 30 watt tube. Okay, so, um, I mentioned that the whole of the complex, the all four buildings at peak load is 132 kilowatts, it's 132,000 watts. Uh, so if you're quick with math in your head, you're picturing quite a lot of those 300 mm -hmm. watt panels to meet 133,000 watts. Um, that's why I mentioned, and you can see here, we maxed out the the PV purchase, um, we ran up to uh, 324 kilowatts nameplate capacity, okay? Now, if it was 324 kilowatts of gas engine generator, you could get about 300 uh, kilowatts out of it continuously, night and day. That's not what happens with solar, obviously. Um, you get nameplate capacity of 324 kilowatts and it produces for, uh, at peak, it produces for only a couple hours of the day, peak output. Uh, so 
over uh, 24 hours, it's more like having a 100 kilowatt generator. Uh, that's its, uh, its capacity factor, it's called. Um, so while using the total space available for PV gets us 324,000 watts of nameplate capacity, in reality, that's not equal to the peak load mm -hmm. of the four buildings uh, because of the capacity factor, because of night uh, and getting less than 100% efficiency out of your panels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the large parking lot that we looked at out back as the most desirable space, that's about two thirds of the available space that we looked at, about 2,000 uh, square meters. So in total, that would support about 200, uh, 210,000 uh, watts worth of panels. Which is two thirds. Two thirds of the available space that we considered for photovoltaic panels in this uh, campus. So that was, we have a picture of that, oh, right there. That's the big rectangle there. That's about mm -hmm. 2,000 square meters or about 210 uh, kilowatts. And then this is a rooftop, uh, another parking lot, and another parking lot there. Okay. Anybody have any more questions? Yeah. I, I just right. wanted to say on, on that point, if you look at the map, clearly you can see there are other parking lots and other roofs. So we had constraints based on the preference of uh, what was recommended by the Energy Committee. If the desire were to make a 100% renewably powered, 100% resilient microgrid, and we said use all the available space on the property, more is possible. Okay. Archie? Uh, may, maybe this is more uh, directed towards the Energy Committee. What, how would implementation of additional um, solar, solar panels affect our existing uh, solar field and the credits that the town gets now, considering that we're, we're sort of essentially fully powered solar-wise for the municipal buildings already. Huh? Does, does, does that, is that a problem? I, I, just, I just don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so we currently provide using 440 kilowatts capacity that's installed over by Page School. <clears throat> we currently um, supply about, or the town currently supplies about 85% um, of site of the capacity. But FY18, it was 86% of the town's electrical energy. Um, and, uh, you know, there might be a couple things that doesn't account for, but, but certainly, currently, the town uh, produces at least 80% of its own energy. And there, what could be done, and you know, this is the kind of thing that would need to be dug into, is that that um, energy could be net metered, or what's called virtually net metered, to another entity, such as the Pentucket Regional School District. I'm not saying that that would that that could be negotiated or not, but something something like you know BRSD or some other um, public or even a private entity could be the off taker for the energy that was produced while we were connected to the grid. And then when we were not connected to the grid, you know, when the grid was down, um, the energy would be on site. Okay. And main difference between that it, that existing power purchase agreement with uh, the 440 kilowatt system and what we've studied here is that if the grid goes down at any point in time, those panels immediately become useless. Unless someone wants to go jury rig it up with a few um, jumper cables or something, they're not going to work uh, when the grid's not working because it's an unbalanced system. Uh, you need the energy storage and a controller uh, to to balance the production of, of the panels. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. think he was thinking about using those. He just wanted to see if it, in, if it in any way conflicted 
with the credits that we're getting off the right. solar field already because obviously we, we talk about the talk has all only been really about if we're going to need it when we're not being supplied with electricity. Well, obviously it's going to be generating something. Maybe it goes five years without not needing a big storm or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what happens to all that energy? You know what I mean? Do we sell it back to somebody or are we already back? So it would be horrible if we're making it renewable energy and we're not being able, somebody, somebody's not being able to use it. Yes. You know, it, it, does it just charge those batteries up and then at the end, even though it goes 365 days, that energy is not being utilized at all when those batteries are charged? I think that's kind of essential. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great point. And um, we did assume in this modeling that the campus would be able to participate in net metering with National Grid. And that's part of the economics of this, pro, uh, this model. Okay. We can certainly not um, foresee the future. We, I, we cannot predict with certainty that uh, there are going to be storms and that there are going to be power outages. But what we've been seeing, uh, looking at historical data, is that there are more storms and there are more damaging. Uh, so that might change, but we don't expect that to change. And um, actually, we expect more towns to be aware of that fact and we know we're going to make this building resilient and lovely. Good. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask, I, I see some people from the audience that aren't from the town. Do you guys have, be, feel free if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, first, I just want your to... Your name? Your name? Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm Gary Martin from Boxford. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to comment that uh, Boxford has a large solar field supplies more energy than the town surroundings. And um, it's only been in, in operation for a little over a year and we've built up quite a bit of credit potential here. Uh, when the because the panels are connected to the grid, when we generate energy to use, it feeds into the grid and the national grid uses it, but they, they give us credit for it. They don't give us payment for it. And we're, we're in the process of uh, making an agreement with our regional uh, high school uh, and people kind of math, math phenomenon. And they're going to be to start buying our extra credits uh, because we can sell them at what, two thirds the price. You can. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, we have to. We can't charge them at the at the full price because uh, uh, I guess we some legal whatever yeah, some, you some, can't mm -hmm. right but it's a good deal for both of us uh, because they're using our extra energy we're going to be getting money that we wouldn't otherwise get we just build up credits that we can't use mm -hmm. so that would be what what would happen if we're generating more than we're using uh, we build up credits but there's probably High school or some other entity around that would be willing to <clears throat> to buy them from you at, at two thirds the price that they would otherwise be paying. So. Can you sell them back to the taxpayers? Kind of like the uh, yeah. no? that, um Then you're competing against National Grid. I guess yeah. so they might not like that. The the way it's been done in um, most parts of the country is that the electricity and the greenness of it are decoupled. So you get one value for kilowatt hours, just electricity, and every electron is equal to every other, um, and there's a market for those, and you get a separate value for the greenness of producing renewable energy or the renewableness. Uh, and you can sell those credits to um, the the market for them is to well there there are um, well-meaning uh, community members who want to support renewable energy, and so they buy renewable energy credits. Um, there are services that allow you to automatically attach that to your utility bill, uh, and there's a number of them here in Massachusetts that do that. So. 
in that way, um, consumers, community members, are effectively uh, creating a subsidy for renewable energy because they want it to happen. Uh, if it's not purchased by that type of buyer, they go into the pool of renewable energy credits, they're aggregators of those credits, and they sell them to power plants uh, burning conventional fuel, um, coal or oil, or gas, and those power plants, uh, they have a, a cap on, within the REGI market, the Regional uh, Greenhouse Gas Initiative market, um, they're only allowed to emit up to a certain level, and they can either uh, reduce their emissions, or they can continue to emit and offset them by buying renewable energy credits. So that's what happens with the renewableness of renewable energy. Um, it's separated from the electricity value itself, and it, it can either be bought by well-meaning uh, community members, or uh, there are some philanthropists who buy them. Um, there might be uh, nonprofits, other organizations. And then there are the uh, the conventional polluting power plants. Okay. Um, do you have any more questions? Because I think I'm like overloaded on renewable energy. Okay, just, I just want to make one <laughs> one point. There is, a, if it were to be configured as a community solar program, the Massachusetts Smart program actually has an additional incentive for community solar. So it's something like another ten percent or so. Financial. Yeah, yeah, financial. Okay. So thank you very much for coming in. Where do we where do we go from here? It's always a, always a good question. Do we wait to hear from you? Are you going to come up with recommendations from this presentation, this you know, this report, or I just don't want to, one don't, of these things, you know? Don't want it to die in the vine. Yeah, or maybe we do. I don't know, but I just want to. And I'm not trying to be fun. I mean, you know, it's been good, m money well spent. Very actually, a little bit more than I want to know about energy and anything, but you know. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, it's interesting about our generator too, because I always thought that because we we have we have a separate generator for this building, an old one. Yes, it was like it's funny. We can just interconnect them. Yeah, for the proposals that we got to put one in that would do this building, I think it would be the same cost to interconnect interconnect everybody to that generator. And oh, it, would be, it would be less for the Yeah, because it, yeah. the, the well, quotes that we got from the, to, re, to, and, to and, for and that, that generator only and that gener generator only does what the present one is, you know, it sheds, it doesn't do full capacity. Glenn, for, Glenn, Glenn, I think we need to be cautious in how we think about that generator. I, I, I know we touched on this at one point, Tristan, but that generator was supplied by Seabrook Station uh, mm -hmm. as part of their public safety requirements to, um, you know, to, to get their operating license. And they bought off all the communities so we right, wouldn't so, protest. So, right, yeah. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. so, but, but I don't know if there are any restrictions on how that can be used. I, oh, I no, I was just know. saying that it was interesting that... That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, that's um, been, but that's been the thing that um, people have always um, threatened us with, um, quite honestly, for a long time. But I don't think none of, any of us has really looked into it. But, but it, I'm not saying that's the way I want to go, but I just found it... It, it's it's all all of those details are in the longer report that mm -hmm. hopefully everybody has access to, mm -hmm. uh, and the need to restructure the contract around that generator is noted in the report because mm -hmm. um, we did understand it's restricted to Maybe. potentially. We don't um, but for the the point of it, it being able to supply power to the whole campus, it's actually not good for most diesel generators to run them below a certain level of, of their rated capacity, and it's it's big enough that it's supplying um, really it's it's overpowered for what it's doing. It would be better for that piece of equipment to power the whole campus. Oh, okay. I'm going to remember that quote. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, it's, it's a good one. So, anything else? I, I wanted to, to thank you for the report. Yeah, that was... And the, 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 the model is amazing. It's the so the numbers, it, yeah, what it can do is incredible, yeah. So you're saying, to be able to get that model, it took a program that cost $700,000 to be... $700 million. I mean, that's what I meant to say. Seven. I wrote that down, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that much, uh, just to... And, just and to, it, it took just to the work of... Program. 
give us that. But I believe it. It's dozens, true. dozens of PhDs at the top research institutions in the country worked on it for over a decade and a half. And when, when we hit optimize, it runs over 200,000 simulations a second. To So it usually takes about a minute and tests uh, tens of millions of scenarios to arrive at the optimal <laughs> solution. And I, I would like to add that... Um, Could you speak a little closer to Yes. That? Please. That, um, well, this is really a unique capability. This uh, type of studies used to cost uh, uh, 10 times more than what you have, but we have acquired this capability to be able to uh, help towns uh, to get to these studies a lot cheaper and faster. It used to take around nine to 12 months and 10 times the cost to get to these results. And um, we are very proud of this capability and it took only five years to put all together uh, to identify the capability, make the investment. So we are happy that you're happy. Yep, well, okay. not five, it didn't take five years for you to do this study. It took five years for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Andrea and I have been working together since um, 2014. Uh, we tested every software tool that exists for this purpose. Mm -hmm. um, there's not that not as many as you might think. Um, you could count kind of a on, niche industry, a couple mean. hands. Yeah. So there's um, there's a handful or two of software tools that have been developed um, by companies small and large, by various researchers and universities. There's a number out there. Um, we tried them all. Uh, this one is uh, we did determine to be the best. Um, but also during that time, we worked in New York Prize, which was a first of its kind uh, $40 million fund to support studies just like this, community microgrid studies. And through that program, 83 communities in New York did studies just like this. Each of them spent $100,000 or more. Uh, so, and it took nine to 10 months on average for those studies to be complete. Um, so you should... And, and the town should be happy. Um, the, the, it was grant funded, which is also good, so the, the town didn't mm -hmm. have to pay a thing, but this uh, study was an order of magnitude cheaper, and it was done in weeks instead of months, uh, the, the modeling part of it. So um, putting that capability together, getting it embedded within a large engineering company, hooking the software tool up to our, um, our procurement department so we have actual real-time prices on commercially ready equipment, that was, that's been our work over the last five years. We're very mm -hmm. happy uh, that the, the study was uh, met expectations. Uh, no, very much. So. But in, in any case, uh, a report is nice, but uh, if the system is not built, it doesn't give you uh, the resilience that you need. Uh, so we hopefully, you said what are next steps. We are hoping that uh, we can support you in the process to getting actually the system built. Great. Thank you very much for coming in. Want to end it, Rick? Yeah, so I, I guess from our committee standpoint, I, it seems... Not I don't mean to put you on the spot about an answer tonight about this, well, if well, you don't well, have that's to. That's sort of where we're going. We're losing our just kind of consulting here a little bit. And, and I think, you know, you've heard a lot tonight. Let's, let us digest, digest it. it. And, then and, and, and then we should talk about it further. We think there should be a next step, but we, you know, we want it to be as intelligent in that step as it possibly is. Well, we'll wait to hear from you guys. We'll wait to hear from you guys. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. You want to, um, does anybody want to take a break or anything? Does anybody need a break? Yeah, for five seconds. And because you guys are on the next, the grant. The Energy Advisor Committee requests to consider a municipal uh, vulnerable preparedness grant. Um, we probably won't be that long, but you know what? We can talk on the phone. Or, okay. And, um, this is that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Hey, thanks. Good to see you. Terrific. Would you give that to Angus because then he'd be able to make copies for all of us. Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
How much was that grant? Uh, 1250. 12,500. Yeah. Yeah. 12,500 was the grant. And, and uh, so, including tonight's presentation, we essentially used up the grant. Yeah. You want to pick up the mic? Oh. Yeah, what, but you, are you going to stay for. Yeah, you can stay for that. Sure. Well, well, well hold on. I want to wait for Arch. I want to wait for Arch. Do you want to step up? Okay. Sure. I want to. <laughs> okay, um, so the next thing, um, Energy Advisory Committee requests to consider a municipal uh, vulnerability preparedness grant. You guys can stay there if you wanted to pass it back and forth. It's up to you. I want to give you some hands. Thank you. About this grant. Thank and you. that was like a 15 page document. So this mm -hmm. kind of distilled it down to four pages. Um, okay. So first question is why we want to apply for this grant. Okay. So um, uh, first what this grant does is um, it's Again, it's a, a state grant uh, given by Energy and Environmental Affairs to communities. Uh, it's to encourage them to plan for um, and identify vulnerabilities in terms of uh, anticipated climate change impacts. Um, it's something that, like the Green Communities Grant, will eventually uh, put us in the position for grant monies, but the first step of it is to put the town through a planning process. Uh, so what you get with the, the first step of the grant is um, money to um, engage a state uh, certified provider that takes the town through an exercise that brings all of the um, uh, uh, town, and town staff that would um, have a stake and have a, a say in identifying vulnerabilities as well as other stakeholders, brings that group together, goes through um, uh, one or two outreach meetings. So it's either um, two four hour or one eight hour session. Um, they estimate that uh, the amount of time that um, it would take in terms of both the combination of volunteers and town staff will be from 120 to 200 hours to do this planning process. And at the end of the planning process, it will help you identify um, what particular uh, areas or infrastructure in town is, is um, particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts. Um, and in terms of, Angus asked us to identify what it really means in terms of town resources. Um, it's a one-year process, so you apply for the grant. It takes place over the, you have to complete the process within one year. Um, there are three status reports, one to three page status reports, and a final report. But um, that work would be supported by the state provided um, provider. Uh, in this case, it would probably be Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, because we've worked with them before, and they are one of the recognized providers, and they're, they're familiar with the we work with them on the Green Communities Grant. And um, the, the final report would be then useful to the town in terms of um, what are the likely areas to flood in town, what kind of emergency management procedures should we have in place, both kind of operational issues as well as infrastructure issues that they would um, identify going forward. And I think the committee feels like this is probably a valuable thing for the town to do in and of itself, just to have this kind of information and to go through this exercise. Um, 
we think the, the possibility of grants at the end of it, additional grants that could be used for funding things similar to what we just talked about in terms of um, you know, investments in, in uh, microgrid components, um, that may come out of it, but the, the, the additional grant money is a competitive process, so we are not guaranteed that we'll get additional money for implementation. But that would be a, a, an additional benefit of it to be able to qualify for that. But um, primarily, we think the exercise is something we would recommend doing just because it makes sense in terms of the town um, taking the time to look at these issues and, and identify where, where we are vulnerable and, and kind of get us further down the road in terms of that planning process. So what you have at the end of it is a final report that can then be used as a planning tool for so, the so town uh, offices going forward. Hypothetically, at the end of this report, we could have something like we don't have enough stormwater drainage. Uh, you know, we, the Merrimack, we need better roads down there. The Merrimack River, our dam at Mill Pond is not sufficient, high enough. Oh, yeah. all, all sorts of things like that. We, yeah. we, and we don't know what, what we might learn in the process. But I mean, mm -hmm. so you just name it. And then they would name all those. And then that would then get us, in a way, saying that when we do say, OK, storm targets to fix and then when we want to if we if we wanted to fix those targets or at least tried to fix those targets then there would be grants available to be able to fix those targets okay but see everything sounds wonderful and we generally always say yes when you guys come before us at least I do because why wouldn't we want to do this but then we have to put a reality of a small town and employees and making sure that we have the proper support and then all of a sudden in the, pro the proper support to handle the workload that all of a sudden we say yes to something because it sounds terrific and then nine out of ten times in the past we haven't really realized the ramifications and all of a sudden Michael Karen's there's a deadline and he's spending X amount of hours on this and other things aren't getting done and we don't have the proper support for you and you know what I mean so that's why I think Angus mentioned that because there is, there is, I don't know. Hidden cost. Yeah, hidden cost. Or, and I, ramifications seem like a negative thing, but when we say yes to something, it means something. Right. When, when, you, <laughs> you, know I mean? when you said 200 hours, you were including like uh, 20 people uh, at the meeting for 10 hours, or, or is that an additional 200 hours? No, that's supposed to be. That is there, the state's estimate, based on from small to large communities. So they say from 120 to 200 hours. Okay, so it's I, like when you fill out your assume on the smaller it says, this should take you 15 minutes. And it never does. It right. takes you 15 <laughs> days. Yeah, yeah. Right. But we can assume we're on the smaller end of the scale in terms of what they estimate. But they, they here are the requirements. They do require eight hours of planning, whether you do that in two sessions or one one day define session. plant. Def, can you define that? That's a facilitated sec, uh, session where you in, invite the appropriate staff along with volunteers. And I would add, in, in the volunteer group, our committee would volunteer to be part of that core team. Um, so you're talking about maybe like the police chief, the fire chief, the DPW directors. When you, I don't know. I'm just trying to so figure out people that are, yeah. those those are likely, probably the town those manager are or water. water well, yeah. Water Commission, Water Department, or probably Board of Health, they would probably have something that would be involved in this. I don't know. Right. And those people need to be part of a f sure. two four hour sessions and volunteers. So when you say planning, so that would be planning how you would go about filling out the grant or, or go about planning with this outside agency to be able to fill out those three reports in that or those three status reports and then the end of the year thing. I, I don't know. I think the I think the planning sessions go through a, a series of questions and they're and they're intended to get the right the right people in the room to provide answers to a set uh, a okay. set of questions that have already been developed. So there's yep. already this toolbox in place. Oh okay. yeah, I, I get it. They walk you through the process and they gather the information for 
Yeah, the outside agency helps us get through that school box. Okay, so they've got like set, set not questions necessarily, but things that they, spark, they set, spark set you pieces in, of information the discussion. Yeah, okay. they want to gather through. And, and probably a process to, you know, where you identify a vulnerability, identify a hazard, and then with all the potential stakeholders or people or people who might be involved, sort of review that. Say so yes, that applies to us, or no, it and, doesn't. And, and you know, an, analyze it. How you know is that a vulnerability? How would we currently deal with it? And how might we go? So we're not starting from completely ground zero, and we have to reinvent. In other words, the the people in the town would have to like, well, what should I, you know? Right. No, 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 yeah. no. It's not from scratch. It's yeah. it's already a, a developed program that okay. towns have gone through. Newberry Port has gone through this planning cycle. I think I read about that, yeah. And the, the service providers have been trained in this, so they okay. they have done it before. So after the, it's a hypothetical, not hypothetical, like you said you have to finish this within one year. The start finish has to be within one year. You have to, you have to bring the people in, hold the meetings, and complete, the, complete and produce this final report within one year. Yeah. So after that, um, is there... Um, we have this document. Are there any requirements about renewing that document annually or updating that document? That there, you know, there or is, is it just a document that we have that, in, you know, it's good forever unless there, something major happens? There is a mention of an annual report, and I actually don't know the details of that. I, I don't. I wouldn't expect that to be exhaustive, but it would be if you had identified any. If, one one purpose of it may be to update your information. You know, as data changes, are are your vulnerabilities still the same? Do they look the we same? We could have built a new year? dam, or right. we could have could something. Have right. Okay. So, what do you think the the uh, man hours involved in applying for, for the grant? Actually, not doing it. We've been talking about doing it, gathering the data, but just applying for this oh yeah to get the, the facilitator or stuff how that's a good what's, question. what's the work involved in that we've been told to quote to quote um, someone who's done it it's not a heavy lift it does require letters of community support I think to show that um, different groups that are going to be engaged in this process are agreeable okay. within the community yes this makes sense um, so it would be something yeah. that your committee would be able to do? You wouldn't need any other outside support other than, you know? I, I, I don't think that's safe to say. I, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm assuming that we would need some support within, within the town, within this building. Of like doing but what, though? To, to pull that final document together and, and make the submissions and, and to identify the pieces of it. For example, if letters of community support. Well, I think other than that, we, that's we the easy identify part. identify that that's what's needed, but then the town would be involved in pulling this together. Okay. You understand how, well, I think we got, well, at least I, the concept of it, I would agree upon. It's the, it's the making out the grant, how many man hours and how many people uh, we really have to do that. Unfortunately, and you know, then, we haven't done it, they and, and, yeah. and, and we don't, you know, we, we haven't seen the full process. Uh, when do you have to apply for this? May 3rd is the deadline. May 3rd. May 3rd. Is it an annual grant that comes up? How did Newburyport do this? And then they did it, they did it the, years, yeah. I think oh. they did it the first time it came up. Does this have anything to do, or maybe the end results of this grant? What's the thing that Baker just signed? He didn't he did it is related. Is it? Yeah, because he, uh, there's some tax about. Um, dealing with um, vulnerabilities and about global warming and so forth and so on. Does that have yeah, anything to do with this? Well, yeah, I don't know where that money was going to be. But you know what, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I do. It was going to be applied to uh, real estate transactions. But uh, that hasn't, that, that's a, that, there's nowhere near happening yet. Yeah. No, but I'm just was curious if that but has something to do, because it seems like almost the same thing. Yeah, my guess is that it's related to this. It may be a separate program, but it may be directly related to this. It may be to fund the grant. Well, I mean, because there are communities that have much more in the way of vulnerabilities than we do. I would assume. And, and, and the cost to implement measures, you know, to protect 
protect themselves are going to be a lot higher than anything that we would see. But so so they need to have the money for that. But well, uh, we, we are on the board. <laughs> okay, so we are. Brian, 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 <laughs> we always. Um, I want to ask Angus because we're the ones that get to say yes to right. something and everybody goes, oh, how wonderful you guys want to be a green community and you do this and we basically really just say yes and we really don't do anything about it other than give you, the, hopefully try to give you the support. So, but we kind of, we get the kind of the accolades in the paper saying, oh, the selectmen want to be part of a green right. communities and then we just pass we it on to some, yeah, we don't do the dirty work. So, do you have any concerns about us saying yes or? That's scary to me. Yeah. But, but I, um, I'd like a better definition of that, too. That's it, well, I mean, I've done, you know, I spent eight years in consulting with cities and towns, and a lot of what I did is facilitation and getting people there. It's a lot of work to do it right. If you want to dash something off, you can do it quickly. I don't do that. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it the right way. And, and I think that that's what, certainly what I've seen with this committee. Um, so I think if you're going to sign on to it, you need to, you know, we, we need to figure out those people, if I'm drawing work with people that are already, yes. you know, having a hard time keeping up with what I've already asked them to do, they get confused. Like, okay, well, do you want me to do this, or do you want me to do what you told me not to? So, so that's where we are. I think this board knows that better than anyone, because you have a very good perspective on, on the number of mm -hmm. things on a plate that you're asked. So, so we don't have, we have negative capacity. I would suggest, I mean, yeah. we're definitely operating with the red line. So yeah. I know for my own personal schedule. I'm no, not, you're right. You yep. know, doing as much as so, so how can we, I understand this was very helpful to bring it down from that big link that we had because I, it made me I kind of, not confused, but it just it was kind of overwhelming. Um, but we still don't have a good understanding of the application and how long it will take and what our real commitment is. Do you know what I mean by that? Right. Is well, there a way that we can get a better understanding of that before we say yes or no? I, I don't feel like I do. The Merrimack Valley, can, if, they, if they have done this before for some other town, maybe they can give us a little info on what, what they think is involved. Right, I, I think we could talk with MBTC and try to get see what perspective they can give us on what that 120 to 200 hours means. Um, or even just filling out the application. We don't even know how, we don't even know how complex do, that is. I do think the application is not complex. Okay. I, I looked at pieces of it and it's... And, and also, I think in part of it is done by, 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 by you know, your 
state of, of approved um, you know, facilitator. Right. Um, so, so, but how can they do the application before we even get the grant? Or do they kind of just do it? I'm talking about the grant to apply. Before we even get there, yeah. 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 So, because Archie asked that question, which was good. I, I didn't even think of that. Sometimes these grant applications take. And, and okay, that's, so that's something that would need to be explored. Just like what is involved. In, in Just on the application step, portion. Step one, how much right. is involved in step one? And right. now we can talk to then you maybe ask uh, Merrimack Valley, hey, how much is this really going to tax somebody? Does somebody need to spend like, you know, in the beginning two or three hours on this a week just so they can facilitate it? Or the commitment really is if you have a good, strong committee and volunteers, we just need, a, you know, eight hours of good community involvement to be able to identify the needs and the wants or whatever that package is, that okay. school package so you talked so about. Sure. You know what I mean by that? And then... Sure. Right. I mean, perhaps we can get the template that is, that is the grant application to take a look at and, mm -hmm. and try to get a, a sense of what's involved there. Um, mm -hmm. That would help. Because I don't want to say... If we get that, would it be possible to spend a few minutes with you taking a look at it to, you know, for, for your sense on it? Yeah. Yeah. But also it may depend on the size, vulnerability, and everything of the town. I mean, maybe the 120 hours is, is the, you know, city of Boston or something. Who knows? So 200 yeah. hours would probably be something like the city of Boston. I mean, we, do you yeah. think that, that we would... Well, there's a box. In that right. box... Right right, is a template for everybody. Yeah. So there could be portions of that box that say, this doesn't apply to us, boom. Yeah. Or this might, only portions but, of that. But let's find out. Yeah. Do you want, I mean, we really have to, no. He, he, and this is not unique to you guys. Yeah. We're not, this We're is, un, yeah, this is unique to all grants uh, going forward. Because in the beginning, when I first became a selectman, everybody just applied for grants no matter what happened. And then there was a couple of police grants that we found out that when we were doing the budgeting process, well, we applied for that grant. It sounded so great. But now it's going to cost the town over the next three years X, Y, and Z just to get that small portion of money because you had to be in it for, you know, whatever. So then we said, okay, hey, let's make all the grants need to be approved by the Board of Selectmen so we understand what the financial ramifications were. So we started doing that. But now there's another component, since Angus is here, then we realize, hey, there's another component, the financial ramifications, and then, hey, how much support is really needed by the personnel? So that's why now that's what the requirements when people come up and ask us for grants, we're asking both of those things, the financial ramifications and what type of support that we're really going to need to do it. So that's, so you are not unique. That's what we're doing for all grants now. So that's kind of the history of the grants process since I've been a selector. Okay. So like, uh, one, one example of something that could kind of, you know, tendrils that could go in different directions. Part of the grant application that uh, description of how the municipality will use the results to uh, the process work for an ongoing or new planning effort to approve the transportation plan, the city direct plan, the traffic plan, et cetera, uh, and it goes on. You know, you have to kind of describe that. So as you know, we're going through the open space direct plan update. Mm -hmm. That has been pretty time intensive. Mm -hmm. Sharing the information and keeping everyone, you know, um, I mean, we could say we're not intending to reopen the book on that or you know other town plans, but it's kind of pushing you toward okay, if you want to get the grant, we want to say oh we're going to be doing this that and the other thing. Each of those could be you know done in I don't know 100 hours or more of staff time. So that's that's, uh, but you know I think uh, I'm happy to meet. I would recommend that I want to know who on staff is doing what so I can make it clear with them so there's accountability and it's not just, you know, I'm not asking you to pick the mm -hmm. midnight every Friday no. trying to pick up the pieces. No, I agree. Do. I mean, that's, yeah. re that's reasonable, right? Yep. Okay. No, that's per perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you said you wanted to give us a couple of updates or, or are those people waiting for, uh, for uh, you? I guess the only thing we might mention is the Green Communities Annual Report and the Green Communities Grant Program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we the, the Green Annual Report was completed the beginning of December um, as per sort of requirement, and so you know, we are eligible to apply for Green Communities Competitive Grant 
not a guarantee that we would get one if we did apply, but we don't think that we're prepared at this point in time to apply for anything in particular. Um, there, there's no, you know, quite honestly, um, you know, if we were to apply, we, we talked about it at the committee, and if we were mm -hmm. to apply for a green community grant, probably the best place to apply for, or the best program would be for something like this uh, municipal microgrid. Um, you know, municipal campus microgrid to somehow mm -hmm. partially fund that. But yeah, to, to try to, now, there's no assuredness that it would that be much, applicable. Are there that, that much funds right. out there for that? Let's see. Uh, well, um, nothing, you know, there's no guarantee of mm -hmm. anything, but each community is eligible for up to $250,000 for a green communities competitive grant. Um, I don't know what towns have gotten that. Last time, two years ago when we applied, we got about $140,000 if I remember right, mm -hmm. um, which was all for lighting improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't know that the green communities grant would be applicable to any portion, any particular portion of the um, municipal campus microgrid, but it's not unreasonable to think that it, that it could be. Um, and um, the uh, green communities folks have said, you're really, you know, you're not eligible every year. I don't know if there's a written policy, but but they want to they want to spread it around. Years. So so it didn't make sense for us to you know pick up a small program for this year and then hope to do something next year as well. Okay. Um, so it's it's um, timing, you know, and everything may be difficult because um, as uh, Tristan mentioned. You know, this is a good year to be doing certain things. There, there are reasons, there are multiple reasons why this year is a good year. Um, and, uh, but I'm not sure how we get there this year. Okay. One thing I would uh, note, really a highlight, I think of the annual report, um, just back in my notes, the uh, town documented an employee gain of 6.6% reduction in energy usage over the baseline year of FY11. So, in substance, Thank you. Wait, anything else? Uh, do you want to talk about the LED program? Or, or the, I mean, the um, vehicle electric vehicle? Do you want to mention that program? I don't think they're granted out. Right. But is there, there, there is an electric this, charging this, station? Right. Yeah, this has been on your radar. The state did um, roll out last Friday a new electric vehicle charging station. And uh, this is money from that VW sell settlement. Oh. Into different categories. Oh. It includes workplace charging, fleet charging, and a couple, a couple different um, types of categories. And so we're we're starting to look at it. So we don't really have anything definitive or any recommendation at this point. In concept, you'd have a just you'd have one hypothetically one charging station centrally located. Well, that you might have you might have more than one and. You know, we've Centrally about, located that people would be able to hook up themselves their own cars or, or start using municipal vehicles in that respect? Or both. Or uh, both. Yeah. Or both. Uh, uh, in our conversations thus far, we've talked about it would be likely located here or over at the public safety building. Mm -hmm. But it would be available to uh, people coming to this building, people working in this building. The workplace concept is somebody takes a car to work and they can charge it while they're at work. That happened with the superintendent at the school, correct? That he had to put a be part of his contract that they had to put an electric um, charging station for his car, not yeah, the so present one, yeah, but the so, one that left. So long term, you know, there's places to think about are places where people well, you know, so this building might be one, you know, because there might be an employee here or employees who decide I'm going to drive an electric vehicle, mm -hmm. and and, uh, um, and or a future town or, or, or a future town electric vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, similarly with a police station. Do you want us to put that part of the questioning to the new police chief? Right. You've already asked them that would that person consider a um, electric vehicle oh, yeah, in the future? Because yeah. uh, <laughs> I know you've all you've been on that. I know you've been on that for years. I think the last three police chiefs that have been around when you've been asking that question. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank that was that was good. Yeah. That was a well spent grant. I'm glad they had time to come in and uh, present it too. It's a lot nicer yeah. having it talked to rather than looking at it on paper.
Discussion of the uh, PRSD regional agreement and school committee work on the draft contingency plan. I think um, we put this on because we kind of wanted a, um, a little discussion before we met with the other um, selectmen on Thursday. Correct, Angus? That's right. Yep. You want to head this? Or? Sure. Well, first, I want to uh, say that uh, I, I notified the board and I notified Anne earlier. The location of the meeting was changed. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Uh, See you. No longer at the town hall. Yep. Uh, so uh, the subject of the meeting is, is going to be uh, uh, the regional agreement and specifically some uh, uh, recommended changes to specifically reference this contingency planning in the regional agreement. And uh, we'll go into those, uh, those details with a red line that you have in front of you, uh, as well as to modify the composition of the regional planning advisory committee. What time is the meeting? It's at 6 o'clock this Thursday. Just, I mean, people are listening. I just want to make sure you've got the time out also. Okay. Joe, do you have any questions on this? Yeah, I mean, I think not questions, but comments. I, I think the changes to the regional agreement on balance, you know, not specifically saying they're all good, but I mean, directionally where they're headed make, uh, make a lot of sense. Sure. Uh, well, I, what I've, um, I'm just pulling it out as, as a question, like section 12 here, it, it seems like they're basically, uh, they want to eliminate the uh, advisory committee. Instead of saying it should be annually, which, which it hasn't in the last several years, unfortunately. And then it says the regional advisory committee will meet time to time. Well, that could be um, 2030. That's really not a, I don't think something that says time well, it says, to time. Well, that, it says time to time. That, that doesn't mean anything. For reasons that may impact, so it even gets worse. It's so wishy-washy, I can't believe it, but that's just me. So I think they're... Um, well, why, it basically, I want to give you the reason. this is, whoever is initiating this is trying to get rid of the advisory committee that's that's what i would say well maybe I, I took it that they were trying to change it to the more of the to use angus's words the staff level as opposed to the elected level that's how i took it but i think part of it and i haven't been as, in, as involved on that language i think the language the other language i think changes to the board can't do that um, i think it's partly to reflect the reality that it's been because, stated for some number of years But that doesn't. I, I'd like to. Change. I'd like to hear Joe's. Joe was on that committee for a while. Did, did you feel it was effective or, or not? Or I haven't been. So what do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on the topic of the day. If there's like a hot, burning issue, but um, I mean, they didn't really do all that much, frankly. I think the committee was set up in the beginning, and I think maybe they said that it, 
when they, when they went into receivership. That's exactly. Why, that's why it was set up. So that's, once, that's the reason yeah. why it was set right. up. So, so um, once that was a non-issue. So I think they they might think that it's gone its useful life. But I don't think it has, quite honestly. Or maybe we can. But do you think it's a good idea? I'm just I'm just throwing these ideas out. So I don't necessarily agree with what I'm even saying. But mm -hmm. is it is it a good idea that that um, somebody from Merrimack knows what somebody from West Newry is thinking, or, or yeah. not? Yes. So let so let uh, Angus Carroll and um, and uh, what's her name. The finance directors yeah, in, Deb, um, uh, of the two towns. Let, let, yes, yes. Let them talk together with the superintendent. But I, but I think uh, Archie is saying well, that might be a good idea. But we would like to have that more in a formal way of saying that they may at least give them four times a year, or at least say that they need to meet, uh, it's not mandatory, but that we would like them to meet, maybe mandatory, um, before the budgeting time or something like that, just before the budget. So maybe the school district has a good understanding how the towns feel mm -hmm. before they make their budget. Or, I yeah, know. I mean, we could formalize that. I mean, I, I think that occurs, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've had three times last week. Yeah. <laughs> so. But, but I mean, I think this is a healthy discussion for Thursday. Personally, I have no voice in the race on it. Mm -hmm. right. I, I don't either. I, I haven't been on the committee, but I, I always think the information, it, it sounds like right, but information is power, and, and we're trying, this seems like we're trying to tamp it down. Also. Well, we should engage, but I think it's a question of who engages, and I'm fine if it's Angus. I don't. Yeah, but I think, but I think you were on the committee. Yeah, yeah, early on. Yeah, I thought but it that, was helpful. I, that I, was, I, I thought it was helpful in the beginning. Because that was in the beginning. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the receivership, I thought it was very helpful because right. there was a lot of once once it there moved. Was, there was a lot of misinformation. People were thinking this and that, and it was almost like each town was pitted against the school district, and we wanted to make sure all information was you know being out there. I think we're all in agreement. I, but I think our, that we might not want it on the level of having selectmen, but I think we're saying that let's have it in there that they need a little bit more. Right. Well, one, one thing I'm thinking about, this may not make any sense, but uh, what about if there was something in there that uh, when the group meets, um, in advance notice be provided to each of the board of selectmen, no less than such and such amount of time, and at the option of the board, they could set a designation that way. Because I, I can promise you there's no intent That's good. That's good that it's happening now, but it might be nice to have it in the regional agreement because yeah. this regional agreement will go on, yes. and that and the other people get hired and other people get elected, and then all of a sudden that's not happening. Yeah, right? I mean, and I can tell you from my sense. experience, not every superintendent is as open and inclusive as this one. So we're very fortunate to have. That's true too. The, uh, that's, 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 yeah, that's a good point. That's actually even a better yeah. point. <laughs> that's a great point, actually. Right? Yeah, I know. I should have had that. I should so, probably been on top of that one. Sorry about that. So okay, I mean, we're talking about the regional agreement, but the the, the I don't know. To me, the bigger, more important issue is the middle high school and working together with the three towns and mm -hmm. how we can get this thing passed. I mean, that's, yeah, I, I that's like the I biggest priority that we have. <laughs> exactly. So, what do we do? Well, I thought that was the purpose of this meeting. Originally, me too, actually. And now it's, 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 it now seems, it, it it's seems regional agreement focused. It, it, that got like, right. Yeah. I I have been consistent with everything I've said. Mm -hmm. You know, the regional agreement was always one of the two items of contingency plan. Yeah, I mean, it has but, to be. But I agree in terms of how this meeting is, is run on Thursday. We want we don't want this to almost dominate the time. So if you could, yeah, I'll definitely put that back to the district. Say you know. I think we're it the ones that, that initiated this, and we wanted to get together with those guys to try to come up with a, 
you know, a positive a collaboration yeah. with the other two, the other two towns to be able to, you know, get this. Um, it seems that's been made secondary. Yeah. 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 I do know they are, uh, you know, they're very concerned about um, the, the event of us as a failure of the goal is unavailable for an extended period of time. They, they really want to have a free agreed to be. Yeah, I don't oh, yeah, that's important. I don't have a problem with that. That's important. In even being able to comment on yeah, I, I would I would agree with anything they have to say. Whatever you say, they yeah. say, I don't know how to yeah. move people around. No. no, they know better on the day to day goings on and the capacities and who they can fit and how they how they educate. Yeah, and how they educate the kids. No. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. I wouldn't mind starting off with that. Yeah. You know, yeah. We could, if we could start off with well, that and then go into well, the contingency. Well, yes, but um, I, I think it's, t it's important to talk about the contingency plan and the cost of failure because that's a big driving point to people that are just looking at cost, saying it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. It's really not too expensive because the cost of failure, that's too expensive because then they'll have a new HVAC system and still a 62-year-old 60, school. Mm -hmm. I, I that's the big, so, I, that's the I big. Don't want, I also don't, and I think uh, the superintendent made that clear too, this was, they are separate issues and we don't want to make that the, that the, the contingency issue and you know, a failure of a school, of a HVAC or something, we're using that as a as a yeah. as a drum to a force threat. people to exactly to to build a new school. I don't think we are, but I think that we have to be realistic and be adults and say be careful that. about it. Yeah, and be it, it, and true and make you sure. Think that it's, you think it's a good thing? Uh, why do you think it's like you can say, "Well, I need a new transmission," and at a certain well, point, we don't want to put more money in an old car. That, you can use that argument, or yep, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. It all depends on. I think it all depends on the people, too, that are there. The people are only going to hear what they want to hear. You need to use a microphone. Mike, can you grab a microphone and give it to Jen, please? Thank you, sir. Make yourself useful for tonight or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the only issue that I would push back on that is that issue of the 30%. If it, if it's more than 30% repair that's needed, um, you, you have to you have to upgrade the entire building for accessibility. Yep. Yeah, we have to make it's, sure it's real. Educated. It's real. Yeah, it's a real, it's a yeah. real issue. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. That's what I'm to okay, that's the next thing. Uh, request for appointment for William Amaral for the emergency management and deputy ADA coordinator responsibilities. So move through June 30th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Review. <laughs> Review of proposed revisions to the, per the policy of rental and town facility. I look for, for some strange reason, the more we have it on the agenda, the more it's on the agenda or something. It never goes away. Okay, so uh, two, two questions. Uh, the first, you had, the board had indicated at a prior discussion uh, an openness to reducing the aggregate uh, insurance requirements from three, from three million to two million. Yep. So I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to take a statement in a meeting and say, well, they changed policy, so this, I'm looking to verify that that was what occurred. Fine with me. Mm hmm. What? I need to throw this out, but could I? Do it, just do it. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Did, did you ask? I mean, we, we also, on here, you mentioned pipe save and equestrian events and stuff. Is, is 
to aggregate, okay, for an equestrian event. So you're saying that it might not be enough? Uh, I don't know. Equestrian events can be extremely dangerous. It's different than a birthday party. I don't know. But I would assume I'm that I would assume that the insurance company looked through all the potential uh, facility uses and um, took into account there could be some um, equestrian, took in some there could be some chess playing, took in some there could be some you know Boy Scout meetings, and said two million is enough. Okay. We're not talking right. About the horse <laughs> Horse on the grass. Okay, just, just. This is the first time. Hold on, Archie. Me, Angus, ask. Make this sure the that they know that there are questions. questions. Go lower. Okay. Yeah. okay. But this is the first. I mean, th yeah. Think about what the they did. Yeah. This is the first time the insurance company's ever said since I've been a selectman. Oh yeah, you have too much insurance. You want you lower it. So, so that's a good thing, I guess. Or maybe we just had too much. Okay, I would go, <laughs> I, I would make sure that the insurance company has a good understanding of what type of activities that are part of all of our facilities forms and um, go with their recommendation. Well, now they're going to, now yeah. they're going to keep it at three million. I don't know. Okay. I don't Whatever. Care. Okay. I just Move don't want to see this on ever okay, again. So, so if I'm hearing this in a way that doesn't need to come back. And no, it doesn't. Contingent. Okay, yeah. I, I move to yeah. reduce to two million contingent on uh, the insurance company's awareness of all use of potential use of facilities, including equestrian. Good. Hey, can can we say this that I never want to see another insurance thing ever again, and that we hired Angus to, to make sure that the town is um, is safeguarded the best possible way with the so, recommendations with from the insurance the company the at, at the lowest cost possible. I mean, why do we have to have all this? Okay, whatever. I don't care. Okay, all Wait. in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there a second? Well, yeah, uh, Joe. Um, I got the motion. Yeah, and then I seconded it. Thank you. Yeah, I heard it. Review of the future meetings potential. Well, uh, what should not, I just want to know, the other question is, about rented, rented to non-residents, what did we think about that? Give a show. Say it. Um, so paragraph one, yeah. two, three, Angus, four. But I want Angus to say it's, it's, I, so people understand at home what we're okay, talking so, about. Yeah, it's, been, it's been my understanding from staff uh, and, and from prior discussions with the board prior to my tenure that it had been the uh, board's policy that uh, the rental of specifically the annex of the old town hall uh, would not be made available to non-residents with a birthday party, big reception, big birthday parties, and so forth. And that's available to residents and to town employees. Uh, so we did receive an application last week from a non-resident who can host an event. We turned down uh, the request on the basis of our understanding, uh, but it was pointed out to us that the language in here doesn't necessarily make that clear. So I okay. wanted to make sure that that was, in fact, the board's understanding of the policy. Yes. Yes, it was. Yes, it was the understanding of our policy. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, we've and maybe before you were here, we implemented that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I know that it has been denied before to people yes. that were not residents for yes. those reasons. Yep. And 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 by the way, the person was fine with it. It was more of a at this point of information. The form isn't real clear on that point. Okay. Okay. It, so let's fix the form. Please. Okay. Review of future meeting, potential joint um, board of selectmen's meeting, planning board on meeting on the 5th. So there's two things that, do we want to meet with them to review, um, Angus will tell us, and, and what date. That date's not good because I want Angus there. If we decide that we want to meet with them on this, what Angus is going to talk about, Angus is going to be, that's a Tuesday, Angus is going to be with the um, FinCon. You know, getting the budget going. So I don't. So I guess why do they want to meet with us? So they had uh, initiated this. Uh, their their work. They continue to work on the two zoning articles that they brought forward this fall. And I think that they are trying to engage this 
board um, they don't want to support it unless they bring it forward then find out it's not what you were looking for so I think they provided uh, a joint statement um, just for uh, collaboration mm -hmm. talk to Chairman Kemmerer who suggested perhaps um, they could come to this board meeting in the fourth I, I guess the message back would be thank you I like the spirit of the collaboration tell me I'm not, I don't want to speak for the board, so correct me. Um, but that date doesn't work for us. If they if they can't come on the fourth, maybe they can give us something. I, I think they. Well, we wanted to include Angus, and he has a conflict. Yeah. So I um I said to 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 um, Angus, well, if they have someone, just give it to us so we can review it. And I think they might have it, but they kind of want to talk to us about it. Maybe, isn't that the tenor of? Yeah. So that, that date doesn't work. We like it. We're more than welcome to come in on the fourth. Is that all right? Mm-hmm. Well, it depends on if we like it or not. It depends what kind of mood we're in after the Super Bowl. That is the day after the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay. Um, that actually concludes the regular business portion of the agenda. Now it goes to the town manager's updates. Angus. Fine. Makes sense. That's what I thought. You okay with that? Yeah. You? Uh, I'll take your word for it. Okay. Since it was sent out broadly, I didn't want to... Okay. No, it's fine. Okay, so. Hey, so with that, gentlemen, today is the um, 22nd... Um, today's the 22nd of January. Uh, it, um, uh, do we have any um, warrant articles that the Board of Selectmen want? We might want to start thinking about that if we have any. Yep. Um, and discuss that at our next meeting. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you could put that on our agenda discussion of warrant articles uh, that the Selectmen might be proposing, please. Yeah, it's already there. I already got it. Okay. Good. Okay. Discussion of request for policy direction uh, regarding potential mailbox uh, policy. Um, again, <laughs> it's always good to talk about this after a wonderful ice storm, crazy snowstorm that we just uh, had. There was, I hate to say it, but there were so many mailboxes on the ground this weekend. It was amazing. Because the snow, I saw a couple dozen. No, I swear. Wow. The worst I've ever seen. Okay, so what are we what are we doing? The, the basic questions: Do you want a written policy? I, I strongly recommend a written policy. Yes, we do. And uh, my understanding, if I'm reading the board correctly, is you'd like a policy that minimizes, if not eliminates, petitions to this board. You'd like something clear enough that it can be administered at staff level. Perfect. Yes. yes. And uh, and finally, I think. How would that actually occur to have been known to happen by a town contractor? Uh, witness. In New Hampshire, we have GPS that's on all our trucks, so we could, we could pin it down. But, uh, it's, isn't that like something I wouldn't mind? A little. It was, it was a handy tool. Isn't it a little he said, she said, though? Somebody gets their mailbox. Oh, it was the town truck. Well, well, well my mailbox. The issue, which I'm sure you come across, where if there's a snowbank, Push the bank and the snow actually disrupts the mailbox, but the file never made contact with it. Uh, that's typically seen as a no fault. 
Yeah. And that's happened with people's fences too. Right. And, they, and they've asked for compensation. Yeah. So do this. We want something at the staff level. Yeah. Why don't you just come back with, with work out something with Wayne and just something that we can approve, right? Yeah, it's fine. I'm, but are you looking for some type of direction so you don't come back and we say no, then you come back again? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I want okay. to make sure I know what target I'm in for. Okay, yeah. I just, just let me, so you have this information. I looked up the, the standard regular mailbox. The Amazon will deliver one for $13.10, okay? That's a cheap mailbox. Uh, no, no. It's, but it's, it's not the mailbox, it's the post, I think. Most but people. The po you, can get a, you can get a pressure treated post for like five bucks. No, no. Yes, you can. A, a single post. I'm not talking fancy with you. But At Home Depot, it costs one of five bucks. No. And, and so anything, so anything we're talking like $50 or, or something like that is, is way over the top. You don't, we don't need to go there. Capped at 50 bucks. No, no way too, too much. much. No. There, there could be a thousand, there could be a thousand mailboxes. White well, see, That's $50,000. You better stop driving around in snowstorms looking at all the mailboxes. It's scaring I, you. I, <laughs> I, I was counting them and it was frightening. So you hear some direction. It has to be direct staff level, and we, we won't. We don't want something over 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 fifty bucks, or it sounds like close to it. So, okay. You can't. All kidding aside, my son wiped out Shike Willis's mailbox with the with a um, with a backhoe or something. I rented. I don't know. Twenty years ago, when jo he's twenty two, and I think he was like seven. When I probably shouldn't. Have, I probably shouldn't have had him driving it up and down the street. But um, he tried to turn it around and wipe his mailbox out. I went to Home Depot, right? And I got that, you know, the one that's already prefab with the little thing and you put the thing on. It's got to be 20 bucks. I would say 50 bucks. That's reasonable. Or nothing at all. What do towns do? It, it's, a, it's a range. It's a range. Is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. That in the some are zero, some are six, yeah. 100. It's, it's hard to know. Yeah. It, it's one of them. As I Well, I think I think what you said earlier. Okay, let, okay. Let's talk about us doing it. Okay, so obviously there has to be some emission on kind of like both sides, and we know everybody has assigned groups, right? And we like to think that people are honest or whatever, so we know. But it can't be that the snowbank pushed it. You know, it can't be that. Let's get give that clarification to them. So if the snowbank's this big, I mean the mailbox is here, the snowbank's out here, and you plow some snow, it hits here, and then all of a sudden it snap the mailbox back here. I think, aren't we talking about if our tr driver like direct hits contact. direct how do, contact? How do, you, how, do you, how do you tell the difference? Oh, it's yeah, how do you simple. Know? How? Because you would see the plow hitting it, you would see, you know what I mean? This bank would be out here, and you're plowing, you know, like, you only can plow the ball, unless... But you need, well, it's just like Edelman, did he touch the ball or whatnot? It could be like the plow was like one inch from the... From I, was trying, the I, was trying, I was trying to make, see, this is where we get. Yeah. I'm trying to make it easier, and then there's always an exception to the rule. Yeah. I don't care. But I think those are the kinds of things... That's that the issue, though. A, a well-written policy could best that decision-making. We'd have to have pictures. You have to have pictures. You'd have to have... Yeah. Slow motion. This is a that's, yeah, that's right. That's right. I want all the angles of that Edelman touch, like they had. <laughs> I want every single angle. He didn't touch it. I know he didn't touch it. But okay, so I have a bad feeling, right? That you're asking us for direction, and we basically have given you none. No, I asked for direction. Oh, okay, great. Right. Okay. Then, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> okay, next thing. Mm -hmm. Long story short, the Mass General Law uh, 
directly references the MEPCD, other than when you support traffic control devices, as you know. And uh, uh, basically, a town uh, doing anything that's not in the MEPCD is, is uh, violating that law. Okay. okay. So those recommendations. Right? This is another one that if we, I don't, I personally don't want to see any road like this ever in front of us again. If this is a staff level thing, or can it not be? This is something that Wayne and you would take care of. Wayne would make a recommendation. You would do it, and there are standards that have to be met. He has to apply with those standards, obviously, the best he can with the road. Some. He only can do the best he possibly can because of maybe the road configuration or whatever. But uh. I, I think in this instance, I was too quick to say, hey, we'll put it on the next agenda. Mm -hmm. Because the suggestion came in a short time after the last meeting. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I didn't review it with the professionals before saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in general, um, you know, you just do it. But I had already mm -hmm. said, oh, I think Mike has I something do, to say about my as the road commissioners. Uh, so if there's actually like a you know a decision to be made on speed or um, right. stop signs. Stop signs. The statute sets the power to say who's good and who's not. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, update on selectman and town manager attendance at MMA annual meeting, January 18th and 19th in Boston. Joe? Mark, did you, I mean, did you go? I did. Yeah, I thought it was terrific. You went um, Got some good, good information on, uh, you know, latest in municipal law, uh, some labor law issues, assessing uh, some new policies there, one of which I know our board of assessors just proposed a town meeting this spring related to uh, uh, potentially increasing the eligible Okay, Joe. Yeah, no, I, I did too. I mean, I went to four individual sessions, as you know, that uh, Angus talked about. Uh, I went to different ones, except for the assessing ones. Uh, I mean, there was one that I thought was kind of interesting, some aspects, increasing participation in uh, boards and committees, and you know, I can think through that, maybe make some recommendations for a future meeting. I always enjoy listening to the, uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor um, and they, they talk through their uh, budget that they're going to release, I believe, tomorrow. Um, they weren't, just in general, I won't go through like every aspect of what they said, but in general, they, they kind of maintained things like uh, the unrestricted uh, general uh, aid and chapter 90. So, I mean, that was a little, you know, I, I was kind of hoping they'd increase chapter 90. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, though, that the lieutenant governor said uh, they were talking about Chapter 70, so Aid for Education, mm -hmm. and I think that this need. now this is my own opinion, I think this needs to be a much bigger focus of towns throughout the Commonwealth. And the reason I say that is there was a session in the Selectmen's Association meeting where they had the City of Chelsea superintendent, and this is a quote, she said, uh, the 44 cities have told their stories, so that's in reference to Chapter 70 uh, modifications that they've been talking uh, and strategizing, and the towns have not as much. Uh, I mean, I think there's been several groups that have, and I, but I think the towns and their respective legislatures need to step up and tell their story because we're getting a much smaller percentage of Chapter 78. And, you know, the, not only the legislatures, the Selectmen's Association and the MMA maybe could be a uh, secondary conduit to get this message across. But if we don't get together as a group, and there's a lot of towns, I mean, all the towns in the North Shore here, the whole western part of the state. Well, there's, the, 200, there's 200 the, and something towns. Yeah, the, 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 the problem is, though, the cities have the population, so therefore they have the legislature. So we need to at least not lose ground, which is where this is potentially headed. So why don't you make some type of recommendation or some type of, maybe some type of letter that we can send to the Sele Selectmen's Association? Um, kind of. Well, I, I mean, I would go all three. I mean, I'd go both both fronts. I, I'd engage our le legislators mm -hmm. and also 
you know, I, I think maybe the Selectmen Association would be a better place. I mean, MMA, that, that doesn't include all the cities. Well, we've started that with uh, Senator Tarr and I think Lenny, and they had something at Masconomic. I think it was about. Yeah, uh, they were. I think they were talking more. Special about, ed. Yeah, special ed and transportation. But that's a good idea, too, because uh, we are underfunded, obviously, on transportation. Mm -hmm. And special ed is an equalizer. I mean, that we would get the same proportionate share. Because funding of special education, that would be equal between cities and towns. Joe, one mm -hmm. thing, if we can make, we might bring down a Thursday night, or at least get all the, all the three towns selectmen there to call right to, we're yeah. talking three or four different state reps with the different towns we have now. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, How many different reps would we have with, with the three towns? One rep and two senators. Just no. Lenny. No, Groveland has another one. No, no. no. Lenny is Groveland. is completely Lenny? He has Merrimack, too, right? Merrimack, too. Yeah. Lenny, oh. and uh, Merrimack has a different. Um, the new lady, I don't know yeah. her name. Merrimack is state senator, yeah. yeah. No, oh, so there's no, no even precinct that's another one? No. No, it's um, uh, Lenny is West Newbury, all, all of West Newbury, all of Groveland, all of Georgetown, part of Boxford, um, two different precincts in Haverhill, and all of Merrimack. All of Merrimack, okay. Yeah, I believe some people from Triton have been pretty active on this front too, so maybe I think, I think it would be good to not only our district, but I mean, it's, it's way bigger than Pawtucket and Triton. It's, it's, oh, I understand, yeah, yeah, but the more you get involved, the more people. Yep. Okay, good. Anything else? No. Okay. Um, follow up on the meeting assignments. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Anything on future agenda items? The thing that we talked about was uh, selecting if we're going to have any warrant articles. I'd like to have a discussion about that. Um, Joe, do you have anything? No. Do you have anything, uh, Archie? I, I will look at that though. I, I did have some things in my head. I got to think it through. Uh, Warren article, so I'll try to uh, put together the thoughts. Okay. So we decided that I'm just rehashing it, but we decided that we were, at least for the moment, done with our changes related to the community compact that we're not going to do any more of those for, at this time. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that because I think the, the one that we should make is the capital improvements. We need to change our bylaw. I think we already did that as a policy, but we need, there's some bylaw contradiction. Yeah. You're done. What, what do you mean, Joe? Well, I, I think it needs to, the way we phrase the policy is how we need to phrase the bylaw. They're inconsistent. And in terms of defining a capital project. Well, no, more of the process that, that, that you drive the process. So why don't we look at that? Why don't we talk about that? Because there's another thing. We met with the CIC, and there's a few, there were a few questions that we wanted to bring back to the Board of Selectmen um, that didn't make it on this agenda when we met the other night that I said that we would bring back and talk about. There's a couple of uh, inconsistencies or clarifications that need to be made in the policy that were brought up. In the policy? In the policy. Can Correct. You? Okay. Let's add that to the board, and we can yep. put, bring those suggestions. And, I and then we can talk about what you want to do. Can you maybe give them to me in advance, so just so I can see it before the fourth? Okay. The inconsistencies? It, whatever the CIC thing was. Not yours, the, mine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, the CIC. I have my notes here. Do you have your notes? They're not with me, but I have suggestions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I left my. Um, you don't have, to, oh, you, you have, no, you don't. Yep. I'll, I'll, um, you have a question? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll repeat your question so you don't have to have a microphone. I'm just curious if there's nothing that Um, you asked the question that if there was an update on the police chief church. Angus? Uh, we continue to receive applications. The deadline is February 1st. And uh, every application that comes in, we're uh, making it available to the board. Uh, 
Correct. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yep. No pond. Are they going to be ready for the fourth? We took them off. Ready for the fourth. Okay. Okay. What else? You'll have the budget all done and everything for us on the fourth. We can look at it. We will. I'm we kidding. Will I'm kidding. The end of this week is the date set for the pre-com budget reviews of different sections of the budget. Uh, we we told every uh, you know, board commission department, and uh, the pre-com has set their schedule. Uh, so we may meet tomorrow night. Uh, we'll be we're trying to assign what um, department board commission will be in what night. They've set the date. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything else, I don't think. Is I move to adjourn. So moved and seconded. Any discussion? If none, all in favor? Aye.